Nicole from the Trappings and Trinkets podcast. Um, if you are a new viewer, thanks for stopping by. And if you're someone who has seen this podcast before, then I'm so happy that you've returned. I'm going to start today with the exciting Christmas yarn and bag giveaway. Um, I In the episode 17, I had said that if you leave a comment on episode 17, or if you leave an iTunes review, or if you leave a comment in the Ravelry Trappings and Trinkets group on the thread for episode 17, that all those ways will make you eligible for the drawing. So I have my compiled list here with the Ravelry. No, sorry, that's the, the podcast comments. And the iTunes, only one review. Thank you, LME Call. I appreciate it. <laughs> and then uh, the Ravelry group comments. So there was 20 people in all. And I've got a random number generator here, one through 20. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. You'll just have, you'll just have to assume I'm telling the truth. So I'm gonna push the generate button and it gave me number 16, which again, it's not showing. Oh, there you go, 16. <laughs> so on my list, 16, oh, it's LME Call. It wasn't your iTunes review, it was your Reverie comment. So. Yay, I'm very glad that you won since you took that extra little time to uh, figure out the iTunes review process, which I totally realize is not the simplest process. But thank you very much, and thank you for everybody that entered. Um, LME Call, I'll let you send me a message. The easiest way is to find me on Ravelry, and I'm Coley75. There, so send me a personal message and let me know your mailing address and your actual real person name, and I will get that bag and yarn right out to you. Yay! Thank you so much if you entered, and I wish I could give a prize to everybody, but I can't. So instead, I decided to do a discount on the ebook that I wrote um, last fall. That was a collection of um, 13 patterns, and they were written specifically for the little mini pack or little mini skein packs, I just call them color packs. Um, or if you have a lot of stash scraps, these are also really good patterns for that because they are patterns that use a lot of different colors but, but a small quantity of each color. So um, a couple of example knits from that color packs and stash scraps book are this hat right here. It's called The Layers and Links. It was made with a um, 100 Ravens, it's their fingering weight yarn. Or there's a scarf, and this one was not written for any specific yarn. It was written more for just, you know, all you sock knitters that have tons and tons of scraps. This is a good one for you. Normally it's a $15 book, and I've put it on sale for $9.99, no coupon needed. So if you didn't win the regular prize, there's a consolation prize. Um, and feel free to share that information with whoever you want. Um, it, you're, you know, anybody's eligible to get the discount. And it's just, it's set on Ravelry that for the entire month of October, that ebook will be discounted to $9.99. So if you are in need of some quick knits for fall or um, some Christmas gifts that will all knit up pretty quickly, there's a lot of hats, a lot of scarves cowls, um, there is a little sweater in there, a shawl, but it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a really good stash busting ebook. All the patterns will really help you get all that extra stash. And I will say it is definitely skewed more towards thinner yarns rather than the worsted or uh, Aran yarn. So if you are a person that has a ton of fingering or sport or DK scraps in your stash, this is uh, your ebook. <laughs> I wanted to respond to some of the comments. I didn't respond to the Ravelry uh, group comments because I didn't want my comments in there throwing off the order of people. So a lot of people responded. I was talking about in episode 17, I was talking about how I was kind of in the process of doing a big clean out of my house, but that my big clean outs just aren't that big anymore because I did a lot of work about a year, year and a half ago to really purge my house of all of the stuff that we don't regularly use. And I will say, I don't want to, I don't want to say that I'm like perfect at this because I'm absolutely not. 
my I was reminded this week of what a disaster our basement still is. So the basement is like definitely there is probably 80% of the stuff in the basement is the stuff that we don't use. So I really do need to do a good job down there. But it's, you know, it's on the list. <laughs> um, try Linda. You left a comment saying that you wanted to purge, but you feel like you don't have the time. I get that. And uh, Asteroid also was talking about that she would like to purge. So I'm going to share this because, let me tell you, I, you know, it's not like I wanted to spend a lot of time doing that big clean out. But I did do it over about the course of a month. And I, there weren't many days where I spent more than, you know, most days I probably would have spent 15 or 20 minutes. There was a couple days I probably spent an hour or maybe a little bit more. But for the most part, it was not really a big time-consuming process. So the thing that helped me a lot was that I found this website, uh, Clean and Sensible, and I'll put that on the screen here. And they had month-by-month -month tasks for every month. And it was kind of like, if you do each, all of these things every month, you'll have such a super organized, clean house at the end of the year, and you'll be so happy. So the, actually the month that I really kind of got stuck on was January. And it's because as I did each of these January tasks, I really did them deeply. I think the idea of the year long plan is that in January, you kind of like do an overview of each of these areas. And then like in the later months, you come back and really do a deep clean of each of the areas. But I was kind of like, let's just get this done. <laughs> so for example, um, things in January, they say one day you should go through all your paperwork. So that, I mean, for a lot of people, that's going to be a, a time consuming thing. Um, day two, front entry or mud room. So for me, that's like we have a little foyer. That's not going to take me very long. Um, day three, clean out your purse. That doesn't take long, right? So, you know, pantry, medicine cabinet, do your dining room, do your junk drawers, clean out your desk, do your linen closet. I mean, all of these cleaning out and organizational tasks really don't take a ton of time. I had to add a few just that were specific to my house. Like we store a lot of stuff along the wall on our basement staircase. So that was one of my tasks. Um, we have a couple of very large game cabinets in our hallway. So I wanted to go through those and get rid of games. And um, then we also, in the hallway, have a bunch of drawers. So hallway drawers was another one of my tasks. So I found this super helpful. You can also go to this website and download this um, little organizational roster here. If I would have gone on February, they kind of get deep into organizing and cleaning the kitchen. Now, there is a day here on day eight here on the January list is kitchen cupboards. So for me, that was just, I just was like, okay, that's clean out the kitchen. So I didn't have to come back and do all these things. Although like things like clean the oven or clean the dishwasher. I've never cleaned out my oven. I actually, I tried to clean my oven once. We have lived in this house for 19 years now. And we actually bought the oven as soon as we moved in the house. So this is a 19 year old oven. It has never been cleaned out. And the reason is because I once tried to clean it out and so you set, it's one of those self, self cleaning ovens. So you lock it and then you push like the clean button and it heats up to, I don't know, some sort of blazing inferno that will just turn everything in the oven to ash and then you're just supposed to scrape it out. But we had so much stuff in the bottom of the oven that it actually lit on fire. And so I was very, I did not like having an actual fire in my house. <laughs> so of course my instinct is to open up the oven and put out the fire. And that's the worst thing you can do because you know, you don't want to let the fire have more oxygen. So that whole situation freaked me out enough that I just, I turned it off, put out the fire. And then I was like, never doing this again. We're, we're never having a clean oven. <laughs> so, and I'm also not a person that uses a lot of, I don't use chemical cleaners if I can help it. So, you know, whatever, like when stuff spills in our oven, well, we'll just kind of scrape off what we can and we, we don't worry about it too much. <laughs> so anyway, I guess that's why February didn't work out for me. Um, March concentrates more on your office. April is all about the bathroom. May is all about outdoors. So you can see how this could be a really handy chart. So if you're a person that is motivated by like, 
checking off the box for the things that you've done on the list, this might be a really helpful thing to kind of get your get yourself in gear to uh, tackle all of those organizational tasks. Um, and then Christine P left a comment of, of commiserating with me about how she also has all sorts of things that are expired. So I think I, after I said that, that like I do, you know, I try to clean out stuff like medicine cabinet, cabinets and the pantry at least once a year. And I don't understand why I still have things that are expired because I do look at expiration dates. I think what it is, is that if something is really close to the expiration date, when I'm cleaning it out, I'm like, oh, it's probably fine. You know, I'll just keep it. And then maybe the next year I go, well, it only expired this past year, so I'll just keep it. So that's how now I've got something that's like two years expired. <laughs> or the other thing is I, I keep it because I know I'm not going to use it, but I want to remember like this is the brand or this is the product that I like to buy. So I leave it in my linen closet or my medicine cabinet because I want I want to be able to see it there for when I do want to buy it because I'll go, oh, it's expired. I need to buy another one of this brand, this item. So I do know how it happens. So Christine, maybe that's why it happens for you. <laughs> because instead of just writing things down, like probably is what a normal person would do, I just like to leave the actual thing there so I can have that to look at. <laughs> Two other comments that I wanted to read were um, Jane Dickinson or Dickinson you were asking me if Curtis Orchard is the orchard that I go to for my apples and I did actually reply to you on YouTube but just in case you weren't able to read that for some reason um, no I, I think Curtis Orchard is near Champaign in my area which is very close to Peoria Illinois um, the big commercial you know, the, the orchard that gets all the people because they have the corn maze and the petting zoo and the playground and uh, you know, they, they sell apples and apple donuts and Concord grapes. They, it's just, you know, it's one of those places that it's always packed. If you ever go, even during the week, it, there's tons of people there. So that one is called Tanner's. And it is a really nice orchard. But I'll admit, like, since our kids were, you know, middle school age, we really didn't go there because it, there's just so many people and it takes forever to get through it. And so now that they're older and they don't want to go through the petting zoo and, you know, and the playground, it's just not worth it. <laughs> so instead, we go to a little orchard in Metamora, and that's the one that sells the honey and the different you pick apples. And that one is called Black Partridge Orchard. And it's just kind of out in rural. I mean, Metamora is pretty rural to begin with, but this is really out. Like, you have to go on a country road to get to this neighborhood. And the orchard actually really just is in a neighborhood. Um, you turn onto a street and there's a lot of houses on the street, but it's, I think, the second house into the neighborhood. And there's like a big, not big, it, there's a little pond there. And um, the orchard is really just a very large backyard to a house. And the, the people that own the orchard live in the house there. So you just drive right into their backyard, <laughs> park and get your apples and honey and stuff. So that's where I got the things that I uh, was talking about in episode 17. Um, and then the last uh, comment that I wanted to address was left by ZJ Goodwin, and um, she was talking about she was um, she was saying that she was watching the podcast in between cleaning up after Hurricane Irma. So I'm sorry, ZJ, to hear that you were in the path of that, and you know it. I I totally understand what a disaster that is, and what you know what a disruption that is to your life. Um, anybody that has kind of followed me for a few years might know that um, my town actually was hit by a bad tornado um, back in 2013 um, and I, we were really lucky our house was not in the path of it um, it cut diagonally right through our town it was a very large very intense I want to say it was a four or a five I can't, I can't remember which one it was but it was one of the really bad tornadoes and it was one that really had a long path on the ground so it was a very destructive tornado so um, while I we were not affected personally that path was about a you know if you drew a straight line from our house to where that tornado cut through it was about a mile away and it, it's crazy to me how we did not hear it we didn't well a mile away you're not gonna see it but I you know I always had the 
impression with tornadoes that they are very loud and they are if you are right there in the path of them but a mile away it was not something we heard while we were sitting in our basement um, and actually our neighbors were out in their backyard raking leaves the entire time like we were hiding in the basement they were in the yard raking leaves when we went down and when I came up like I, I needed to use the bathroom in between like they, they canceled one of the tornado warnings and then they said, well, there's going to be another one here in a minute. And I was like, oh, great. I need to go to the bathroom. So I ran upstairs. And when I came up my basement stairs, I could see right out my kitchen window. And I, saw, I looked at the sky and I was like, that is not a color of sky I've ever seen. And I don't need to go to the bathroom that bad. So I went right back downstairs and we all stayed in the basement until the all clear was sounded. Um, but those neighbors were still out in their backyard the entire time. So... It is, it's crazy how close you can be to a tornado and really not, not know that it's there. Um, so anyway, I, I totally understand what a disruption that is. So I was going to offer, you know, there's probably a lot of people right now that feel like they want to do something to help out with the hurricane victims. And from the experience of trying to help other people deal with the impact of that tornado, I feel like I do have a couple of suggestions to offer. Um, the first one is when you are donating, please be mindful of what you're donating. The, the best things that you can donate for people are money. Um, it, if it's a thing like a hurricane where they can't get fresh water, that kind of thing, that is helpful. Fresh water, toothpaste, toothbrushes, um, you know, deodorant, kind of personal toiletry type products because what happens is that people who are displaced from a disaster either have to go to a shelter, go to a hotel, go to relatives house and right away the things that they need are those consumable things. So if there's an organization in your area that is collecting consumable products like toiletry items, fresh water, that kind of thing, it is helpful to do that if you're local but if it's something like if you're in Oregon and you want to do something to help the people that are, um, you know, dealing with these disasters, it, the, the best way that you can help is by donating money to a local organization to that disaster because it's so nice to want to give fresh water, but unless you know, like, there's a big truck leaving from your town to drive down to the disaster area, it's going to cost so much and, you know, be such a hassle to ship those things to the people that it would be much easier and much more efficient to just give money to the people that can get those things more locally to the disasters. The second thing that I know is that, and I don't want this to be taken as, you know, that I'm anti-Red Cross because I'm absolutely not. They are the leading blood donation drive people. Like I think that kind of work is essential and fabulous. And I'm so glad they do it. But what I found from that tornado experience is that the organizations that were leading the recovery in our town were not the Red Cross, were not FEMA. They weren't the large organizations that you think of right away when you think disaster. It was actually the churches and there was a community fund set up it was just called like the Washington Community Fund for our town of Washington. Um, so if you want to help in a specific area, try to find out if there are local groups that are trying to do good to help. So usually they will have set up some sort of some sort of nonprofit fund that you can donate to to help them in their recovery efforts. Um, the thing about the Red Cross is that though that money that you give doesn't necessarily go to the disaster that you are trying to help out with. It kind of goes to a general fund and who knows where it goes. So, um, so just be conscious of who you're donating the money to and try to make it as local as possible. Um, the third thing is, and I kind of already talked about this, is that if you are donating things you know, I think that people have the impression like, well, the people that lost their homes in our, you know, our, our town's tornado, they don't have anything. And that is absolutely true. I had friends that went to hotels that night, did not have anything, had to stop at Target on the way, you know, and they probably didn't have, even have a car to go to the hotel because that's how bad the tornado was, that cars were destroyed that were sitting in their garages. 
So if they were lucky enough to get to a hotel somehow, they had to stop at Target in order to have toothbrush and toothpaste. They didn't have underwear to change into the next day. So I, I know the, the, um, the feeling is there if you're a person that has extra clothes that you think, well, I'm going to donate these to the people that lost their homes. Um, the problem is that that makes a lot of work for people that are trying to help. And if people are donating stuff that is inappropriate for the situation, then there's this whole other pile of stuff that then those organizations have to deal with. So we were, um, our tornado hit in the middle of November and my family, we worked a little bit in the, um, the group that was taking donation, clothing donations, household item donations to try to organize and get those things to the people that needed it. Um, and we had like, we had shorts, tank tops, like summer clothing, you know, middle of November in Illinois, it's highs in the fifties, maybe the forties. Like there's no, there's no situation in which you're going to be wearing shorts and a tank top. Um, we had bathing suit donations. We had Halloween costumes. There was just a lot of stuff that we were kind of like, what, like, what is this? Like slinky little tiny nightgowns. So just be mindful of the things like don't, don't donate as if it's a goodwill donation. Um, you want to donate things that are seasonally appropriate, that are still in very good shape. There were things that were donated that were so ratty and full of pills and looked so used that you just, you didn't want to pass those on to the next person because they, they were past their useful life. So really take a look at the things that you want to donate and ask yourself, if, if I was given this thing, would that be really helpful to me or would that just be another thing that I would maybe use for a day or two and then as soon as I could replace it, I would. So you want to give things that are useful, still are in very good shape, are seasonally appropriate, and um, are going to be able to be useful immediately. So those are the things that I that I learned from our experience. Um, another thing that, that I'll, I will say is that if you're a person that really does feel personally affected by this, um, a couple of the things that I did to help myself and my family were um, I designed a sock pattern that was a benefit to the Washington Tornado Fund. So the, the whirlwind sock pattern, if you've ever seen that one, I'll put it up here on the screen. That was a pattern, a sock pattern that I designed actually as soon as the tornado hit, my kids and I, well, a couple days later, we left our home and went up to my parents' house because they were a couple hours away and they, the tornadoes had not hit them. So I wanted to get me and my kids somewhere safe that had power. Um, my husband did stay behind because he was still working half days and then he was doing volunteer stuff half days that, that first week. Um, but it was, you know, the temperature dropped. It was maybe highs in the 40s that week and our house didn't have power. So he was trying, I think he ran a generator that could keep the refrigerator and maybe he could turn on the lamp or something like that. But it wasn't a great situation. So while my kids and I were out of town there for a few days and we were kind of feeling disconnected, but also, you know, very upset and hearing about all the people we knew who had lost their homes. So one of the things I found was that just engaging yourself in some sort of thing that is going to help to benefit that disaster really helps. Um, and then for my kids, I decided to involve them in making advent calendars. Um, since it was a middle of November disaster and we did know, we probably knew personally about 20 families who had lost their homes, like completely lost their homes. Um, and a number of those families had young kids. And so with my kids, I said, okay, you know, we know, let's take these dozen or so children that we know who lost their everything. Um, and we're going to put together advent calendars so that every day in the month of December, they're going to have some little fun thing to open. So, you know, and a lot of them, they were living in hotels for this time or rental houses because it's going to take a long time to rebuild their house. And these were, I mean, these were middle, middle or upper middle class people who they had insurance. They were going to be able to rebuild. 
but that's still a traumatic thing for a kid to have to live in a hotel for, you know, a, a period of time because everything that they've ever had and ever known in their life was destroyed. So um, I thought it would be helpful for my kids and for me and also for the kids in the families we knew to have some, you know, happy thing to look forward to. So we thought of, you know, what, probably 24, I guess, ideas of things that we could put into little, we just like use little paper bags. We got these crates and we would just put little gifts into each of the bags and give each child a crate. And that way, if they're in a rental house or in a hotel or wherever, they could keep all their little things together and they would have a gift to look forward to each day. They could use it as an advent calendar. And a lot of the things we were really concentrating on trying to fill those bags with things that the kid, like activity type things that the kids could play with in their hotels or in their new little rental houses. So um, I don't really remember too much of what we put in there, but I do remember it was things like puzzles, stickers, um, coloring books. There were like little dress up things for the girls, like bracelets and, you know, plastic earrings. There were little treat food things um, in some of the bags. So if you have any sort of, um, if, you know, if, if you, personally know people who have lost a lot from these hurricanes and you want to do something nice for them you know it's, it's not really advent calendar time but you you know maybe you want to bring them a little care package that is Halloween themed and that way you know while mom and dad are either trying to clean up the house or maybe they had to leave their home and stay somewhere else so the kids aren't there with their toys or things to do they might have um, Halloween puzzles and Halloween coloring books and just different fun Halloween things that they can look forward to playing with. So um, that's all. That's all my disaster talk for today. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about knitting. I actually have been doing quite a bit of knitting these past couple weeks, and I've been working on three new. Hats. I have one that this is the final version of this hat. So this is a fun little cabled hat, and this is done in Quince and Company Osprey. And as you can see, it has this like circular cable that runs up the hat. Um, this one is going to be ready for test knit probably by the time this podcast comes out, because all I have to do is make the chart for the pattern. So if you are interested in test knitting any of these things, come and comment in the Ravelry thread for episode 19, and I'll point you in the direction of the uh, correct test knit thread for each of these. So this is the first one. It's just like a knitted beanie, but it has these cables all the way up it. My second hat, this is a, it's an approximation, but it's gonna get some changes. So this is not the final version, but this is close-ish. And unfortunately, the blocking did not quite fix. There's like some weird, like big stitches here. So ignore that. <laughs> so anyway, this is the second hat. And this one, I can't quite decide. Like one of the things that I have to figure out on this hat is if I want this to be a beanie or if I want it to be a slouchier hat. So I'm a little, I'm a little on the fence with that right now. But anyway, this one is more stripes that are crisscrossed by these bumpy lines here. So that's number two. Now, number three, this one has a few more problems, but this is like, you know, this is attempt one. So one of the problems that this hat is having is that the yarn that I chose is a bad match for the pattern. So sometimes it happens, whatever. This is um, Lemonade Shop yarn, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the yarn. I really like the yarn. Um, I got it in DK weight, and unfortunately, in the DK weight, the circumference of this hat does not allow these little color bits to be like all over the place and that was the effect I was hoping for instead what I got was a lot of pooling and this was not what I wanted for this hat so this was a bad yarn match for the pattern so I do like this one as a slouchy hat and I do like the different textures we've got sorry that's ribbing it's brioche stitch stockinette and then there's some reverse 
stockinette also in here. So I'm redoing this hat in a solid color. So I do like how it's turning out better here for sure. Um, and I also bought another skein of yarn that is similar to this but that I hope is gonna give me a better effect. So I think I'm gonna be doing two versions of this hat. Um, along with the solid color that I just showed, I bought another skein of yarn that is very similar to this, but that is a different weight. So this is fingering weight yarn instead of the DK. And I'm hoping that that will allow this little color pop to appear more randomly rather than just all in big flashes like that. Like that right there is terrible. <laughs> that does not look good. So we're going to re-knit it. And if it turns out well with this yarn, this is a stitch together yarn, I believe. Um, if it turns out well, then I'll publish this as a pattern with two options. Um, but if the, if this yarn still is not a good match to the pattern, that's okay. Got to be flexible when you're designing. So maybe this is just a hat that needs to be done in a solid or tonal colorway. And, you know, sometimes that happens. So we'll see how that all shakes out. So anyway, if you have ever done test knitting or if you would like to try some test knitting, um, hats are a great way to get into it because it's really a pretty low commitment. These hats, um, I made all three of them in the matter of about four or five days. So they're, none of them take very long. Um, so just comment on the Ravelry Trappings and Trinkets group thread for episode 19, and I'll get you hooked up in the right place. Um, oh, I was going to show that Lemonade Shop yarn. I also got two other skeins, and honestly, I don't know what these are going to be yet, but these are Sock Yarn Toxic Hippo is the colorway. So I thought those were very pretty. I don't know, like maybe a shawl. It's not enough for, um for a shirt or anything like that, but I just like the, all those little color flecks. Um, okay, one more knitting thing is some socks. I've been working on these socks. My husband is like, why don't you give up on those socks? <laughs> He's watching me be tortured by this sock pattern. And let me just say, at this point, it's like a pride thing. <laughs> like, I will not let this pattern defeat me. I actually recorded about a half an hour of talking about the no-show sock pattern for episode 18, and I ended up just cutting it all out because I was like, I have to find a better way to say this. Um, I will, and I, I've started a second no-show sock. I finished the first one. It looks terrible. I, I do not like the way it turned out. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't, well, I, I was following the pattern until about here, and then the heel instructions completely lost me. The foot instructions also lost me, but I was able to backtrack and correct myself. Once I got to the heel, it was like, I don't even know what language this is in. It was very confusing. So I, I am reluctant to criticize it too harshly because um, I'm pretty sure that the writer of the pattern um, speaks French as their first language. So it could be a situation where this is an excellent pattern written in the original language that it was written in. Um, and I will say on Ravelry, there's over 100 project pages. So people have figured out how to do this sock pattern. But I suspect that whoever did the translation to it just didn't do a great job. So I think that probably what I'm dealing with is a not, it, it's a translation of a pattern that was not done in the, the clearest way possible. So I understand the basic concept of it, and that is that this is a pattern that uses a lot of short rows. So if you're talking about the instep and the, the uh, sole, so if this is your foot, okay, this is your foot. The top of your foot is the instep, the bottom of the foot is the sole. So in this pattern, the sole of the sock uses a lot of short rows. I, I'm pretty sure there's three short rows for every one instep top of the foot row. So that means that the sole is quite a bit longer than the instep. And what this does is that when it's being worn, it pulls the instep down so that 
it exposes more of your ankle. It's not like a turtleneck ankle sock. It's like a scoop neck ankle sock. So the, the concept of this sock is great. Um, I don't know what's going on with the heel. I'm, I'm giving myself one more try and I'm gonna see if I can follow the directions the way that they want me to. Um, it's challenging. I will say that, it's very challenging. <laughs> so I was gonna show you the two socks that I finished just as plain vanilla ankle socks. So I've got this one and this has a modified short row heel. And then this one has a flegal heel. So can you see those two? They're very, very similar, but you can see that the flegal has this line right here, right there. That's where the gusset stitches are increased. And then the decreases happen here right at the back of the heel. So this one is a slightly roomier heel, but the short row heel, um, this is like a, a modified short row. And I actually, I'll put a link to it in these show notes because I did, I did find that this short row heel technique works a lot better than short row heels that I've done in the past. Um, this is a slightly smaller heel than the flegal heel. So depending on how your foot is shaped, you may feel like one fits you a little bit better than the other. Um, I'm kind of in the middle. There, I don't strongly prefer one of these over the other. But with both of these, I was a little disappointed that the ankle sock came up so far on the foot. Oops, that, this is what I'm talking about when I said a turtleneck. So if this is your foot, you know, this is your leg right here. So this is actually coming up to your leg. What I wanted was a sock that fit more like this. And that is what I'm getting with these no-show socks. So you can see that this one does come down a little farther here. See how you, this more of this hole is exposed on the no-show sock blocker. So this one comes down farther on the instep, uh, but this heel, like I said, it's a mess. It's a complete mess. So one more try. I've cast on, I'm, I've gotten through the toe of that last sock. So, and this really is the last sock. After this, I'm done with this pattern. Unless I have some sort of epiphany and I, everything makes sense. I've been working on this pattern for like a month and a half, at least. I, I highly doubt that's going to happen. You know I can't finish a podcast without giving you recommendations for sweets, right? <laughs> I'm your sugar pusher, Nicole. And um, I also, you know, if, if you haven't seen my podcast before, I'm pretty severely lactose intolerant. And that is why... I'm so happy when I find sweets that I can eat because let me tell you, if you take like butter and milk and whipped cream and ice cream and sour cream, <laughs> all the creams, if you take all those things out of your diet, that cancels out a lot of desserts. So when I do find a dessert that is tasty and also doesn't make me sick, I make, I'm really happy about that. So peanut brittle often will have butter in it. But guess what? This one doesn't. Ingredients are peanuts, corn syrup, sugar, baking soda, salt, and flavor. I don't know what the flavor is, but it's not butter. <laughs> so these Hammond's peanut crisps, they come in a lot of different flavors. They have almond crisps. They have s'mores peanut crisps. Um, what else? I think they have like chocolate covered or something like that. There's maybe eight different varieties, um, or maybe there's more, but that's how many my grocery store has started carrying. Um, but these are really good. You will not miss that they don't have butter in them. Oh, and by the way, the reason I'm rattling off all those other flavors are those, those are the ones you can't have if you're lactose intolerant because they all have milk or butter in the um, ingredient list. But the peanut crisps do not have milk or butter or any dairy products. So feel free to indulge if uh, lactose turns your stomach and makes you very unhappy in your abdomen. <laughs> so that's a very yummy treat. And you don't even have to cook it. You just go to the store or go on, I don't know, Amazon or something. I'll try to find it on the web. And I'll put a link in the show notes that you can find at www.trappingsandtrinkets.com. Um, that is all I have for today. So thank you so much for spending time with me. I hope you enjoy your knitting.
for the next couple weeks, and I hope to see you back mid-October for episode 20. See you then. Bye!